Hi, this is Mark Hyman from Greensboro, North Carolina, my friends. You are watching The Best Practices Show with Mr. Kurt Barron. Take it away, Kurt. Guys, thanks for watching the best practices show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're looking to be one of the best or get better in dentistry, you do not want to miss this show because I've got my good friend, Dr. Mark Hyman on. And today we're going to be talking about the 10 commandments of successful dentists. And this guy knows what he's talking about. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to absolutely love this. Now, a couple show notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you're watching this, if you have questions, add them to the feed and I'll dish them to the man himself and we'll get it, the answer straight from the master. Or if you're watching these later on, like a lot of you do, continue to add questions to the feed because we want you guys to get the most out of this. A great thing to do too is you can share these with your team. I was talking to a dentist yesterday and she's like, oh my gosh, I shared that one episode with my team and it was a great way to describe where I wanted to go. So continue to do that. Also, keep sending us suggestions for shows. Love the shares, even the shares yesterday. We are up over 39,000 followers on Facebook. It's only been less than two years. We're so grateful. And over 150,000 of you listen on iTunes or have been to iTunes. And all I can say is thank you. Now, my guest today, if you have been... The only way you wouldn't know who this guy is is if you've been living underneath a rock because he is one of the premier seminar leaders in all of dentistry. He has spoken at every major dental meeting in the United States and a lot of them outside of the United States. Uh, he is just a ball of fire. I enjoy watching him speak all the time. I call him my good friend, Dr. Mark Hyman. Now, Mark, I know you are. Thousands of our viewers know exactly who you are, but if I'm a young dental student watching you and I've never heard you before, give us a little bit of your story. Kurt, hey, thanks for having me again. This is a real treat to be at the knee of the master because you are the master. Only 39,000 followers. That's uh, frightening. Imagine what's going to happen when you start trying hard. <laughs> but friends, I'm Mark Hyman from Greensboro, North Carolina. I was born in Greensboro. I went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I am a Tar Heel. Applied to dental school, got in, was a freshman class president, playing intramural soccer, football, basketball. Um, loving it. Midterms came. I forgot to study and just got slaughtered. And the first week back, spring semester, first year of dental school, I quit dental school. Mm -hmm. And I was in my apartment trying to cry and nothing would come out. And the only way I could go to sleep was to say this nightmare is over. I went to tell the dean I was going to quit. And he said, great, go on back to class, come back at halftime and we'll sign you out. And I went slinking down the halls of the UNC School of Dentistry and ran into a young professor, Dr. Ron Strauss, who saved my life. And he said, Mark, it's okay. Being a dental student is nothing like being a dentist. Just give it another hour. Give it a day and see how you do. And I had a decent morning, went back to tell the dean I wasn't going to quit. And he acted disappointed. May he rest in pieces. <laughs> but I had a decent day, decent next week, finished first some second semester first year dental school, started that summer in clinic, caught fire, and I graduated dental school in three and a half years. I joined American Dental Volunteers for Israel, worked for four months as a volunteer dentist in the Holy Land, just north of the Sea of Galilee, right at the foot of the Golan Heights. Grew a beard, grew my hair long, had a blast, played basketball with the soldiers every afternoon. My last week there, was a pretty profitable trip, Kurt, because I met my wife. Awesome. Married 33 years, so that was a hoot. I came back to Chapel Hill, did a two-year hospital residency, and then moved back to Greensboro, North Carolina, where I bought basically a 10-year-old bankrupt dental practice. I had a half part-time hygienist, one receptionist, one assistant, and I did everything wrong, and the practice did worse. And my third month, I heard Miss Linda Miles speak, and that changed my life. And Linda looked at me, some pathetic character from some Oliver Twist movie. Please, sir, I have some all. I said, please, Linda, I bought this practice. I don't know what I'm doing. And she said, poor child, let's have lunch. Mm -hmm. And she listened to me whine and moan and complain and said, why don't you do this, that, this? Gave me three little ideas. 
bam, next month the practice doubled and then doubled. Then I met Kathy and John Jameson from Oklahoma. Jameson Management changed my life. They've been dear friends and inspirations. And my practice went from essentially bankrupt with two and a half employees. By the time I left the practice, last December 14th, as I sold the practice to my former student, Dr. Steve Hatcher and Dr. Sonia Sharani, and uh, we had 17 teammates. And the practice was top 1% in the country. So when I speak, my dear friends, it's real world, use it Monday morning stuff. It's essentially don't make the same mistakes that I did. And I'm just very grateful, honored to be here. My time at the Panky Institute changed my life, my time in Spear Education, my time with the Dale Carnegie Organization, and the privilege of the podium. I got to be your host, Kurt, in Chicago at the Chicago Midwinter a couple of years ago, and that just was a frightening experience. <laughs> Watching you just set yourself on fire and run around the room and, and giving pearls left and right. So that's one of the unanticipated cool things happening, the privilege of the podium. People said to me, Dr. Mark, why do you want to go hang with a bunch of dental people? And I'm like, the losers of dentistry don't go to seminars. They don't go to Panky and Spear and take Dale Carnegie. That I get to hang out with men and women like you, Kurt, and Uchi Odiahu, and Erwin Becker, and Kathy Jamison, and Linda Miles, and on and on. So that, that's that been the great privilege of my life. Now I'm teaching, in case you can't notice at my t-shirt, I am now an adjunct full professor at the University of North Carolina School of Dentistry in Chapel Hill. Our dean is a 49-year-old superstar, Dean Scott DeRossi. He's got four new department chairmen. The school is just on fire. Recently, UNC School of Dentistry was ranked top two dental schools in the world. Wow. So, uh, just makes me so proud. I'm on the admissions committee as well. And the quality of students that we have coming through is just staggering. Yeah. And it makes me so proud for looking at these young men and women that are going to be our future. So it's really cool. So my students that are watching... You may wonder why I'm not teaching today because I'm online with this madman <laughs> and uh, I'll see you tomorrow, fellow Tar Heels. And for the rest of the men and women listening, it's my privilege and honor. And uh, let's just have a great time. Yeah, well, it's our privilege and honor that you didn't quit. And that's an interesting part of everybody's journey. You go through these tough patches and you stick it out and you've been an incredible leader, mentor, influence in dentistry. And the reason we're having this conversation today as I always do, I always learn something great. I'm just going to say this. If you're a dentist and you haven't seen this guy speak, you got to have, you know, because one of the missing ingredients you're probably having is how do I motivate or inspire the people around me? And this is your guy. So go definitely go and see him. The other thing, Mark, I want to talk about now that we picked a little bit of a controversial topic here and we're going to dig into that, but there are things that you've noticed in more than what, 20 years of speaking or teaching, you know, you see these patterns and success leaves clues. And these are some of the things that you've learned for sure. So describe the topic that we put on this show and then describe why this is so important in dentistry. Right. Our topic that we picked was the 10 commandments of highly successful practices you know, we just passed Jewish New Year's, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. As I describe myself, I'm a proud practicing Hebrew, a redneck Jew. There are not many of us. <laughs> Box of bagels with grits on top of them. It's not a pretty sight. I explained to my team about the Day of Atonement, that you recount, you fast for a day and recount your sins. My team said, just a day, you probably needed two weeks, but that's really nice. So the Ten Commandments to me are ten experiences, ten expressions that I learned from other men and women that I put into practice every day that I teach at Chapel Hill and that I have in my seminar. So the number one, that one of the first of the 10 commandments is the reason most people never accepted optimal care dentistry, Kurt. Why? Because no one ever asked. Dr. Erwin Becker taught me that. And that's what it just kills me that we, I don't understand why is it our self-esteem? Is it a lack of knowledge, a lack of experience, a lack of verbal skills? Why when patients are paying us good money to come in, why we don't give them the courtesy of asking, do I have your permission to tell you what I see? And when they say, yes, you offering the very finest dentistry that you have to offer. Yeah. Now, would, would it be fair to say, Mark, that this is a turning point in most every dentist's career is when they commit themselves to the truth and telling patients the truth and not, you know, beating around the bush. Is it also fair to say that most dentists are never prepared to, quote unquote, not necessarily sell, but they're hoping they're just going to work on teeth and they realize, wow, I got to communicate with patients. Is that, would you... Would you say that's probably true or not? Very, it's incredibly true. You know, what I try to say to my audience is too, you think about it, you don't go to Walmart and tackle people and say, do you want your teeth done? They walked into your dental office. So doesn't that show some interest of some mm -hmm. level of healthcare? So I have an interesting thing. I'm going through some physical therapy, therapy now after 32 years of private practice. 
my L4, L5 is bulged. I got a bad back, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to my physical therapist. And of course, the, de- the medical insurance denied some of the physical therapy. And my therapist, who I love, there's two th- women that have been working on me. And she said, you know, well, Dr. Mark, if the, if the insurance isn't going to pay for it, if they may even try to submit, switch you to Medicare and we're not a Medicare office, so you'll have to go somewhere else. And I was like, well, who told you money was an issue? I love coming here. I'm used to coming here. I've been coming here for almost 11 months tr- getting my back worked on. And if the insurance stops paying, you've already presumed, you've assumed that I'm going to go to another practitioner. I never said that. Right. So our physician colleagues, lovingly, they've already bent over and taken it. They've already given up. They're no longer doctors in a relationship with their patients. They're providers of a commodity. And in dentistry, we don't have to play that game. Yeah. So I just wanted to say to this woman, you don't know me. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what I value. All I want to do is get healthy. I got money. Mm-hmm. So who told you money was going to make me go somewhere else? It's just it, it was mind boggling to me and infuriating to me. Yeah. Now this whole thing, this, this turning point in your career is a cultural thing too. It's not just on the dentist. I mean, you got to teach everybody else around you to value what you do and ask patients if they want optimal care. It's, it's the truest thing I, I will say to folks when we had treatment coordinators, Jameson management convinced me to put my number one producing hygienist as my treatment coordinator years ago. And I was like, I don't want to do it. What's going to happen to my hygiene department? Look at all this production that she's getting chairside. For six weeks in that position, she added, I think, 80 some thousand dollars to my schedule, just sitting down, having the time to talk to patients. So the team's got to buy in. If you have a treatment coordinator that doesn't believe in your work, that doesn't believe in the value of your work, you have a treatment coordinator that's never made a purchase of more than $5,000, it's going to be almost impossible for them to present a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar treatment plan. So please consider that. Some people say, well, I'm going to get the lowest paid employee to be my treatment coordinator. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. We had Elena, Elena Berenger Ivy, who was my star valedictorian of her high school, summa cum laude, UNC Chapel Hill, got married, didn't work out, went back to hygiene school, number one in her hygiene class, was my one number one producing hygienist. That's who Jameson had me make my tre- treatment coordinator. And I'm like, ah, is that a good idea? Made me millions of dollars because she was brilliant and articulate and verbal and uh, confident and loved me and trusted me and was part of my family. And she would sit down and look you in the eye, Kurt, and say, you got 20 teeth that look fantastic. I see dramatic changes in eight of them, Kurt. Your investment's going to be 14900 When would you like to get started? Mm-hmm. She was just on fire. So that was a real treat. And I had a series from her. I went to another hygienist who was a star, Lauren Gardner. And when she had a baby and went on maternity leave, I put my number one dental assistant, Tina Calloway, who was my lead dental assistant for 19 years. And I was like, that, now that doesn't make sense. You're taking my number one hygienist and my number one assistant. And Jameson was like, trust me. Tina had only worked chair side with me for 19 years. And she could say, I've seen him do this for decades. He's my dentist. He's my mama's dentist, my grandchildren. It was just, it was amazing thing. So to offer the optimal care, first, you got to have it on the shelf. Panky and Spear ta- and Dawson talk about that. If you don't have the knowledge, you can't offer it. So that, that's, that's a piece of this puzzle. To me, I said, for our young docs that are watching, I set a continuing education goal of doing 100 hours of continuing education every year. I got my fellowship at the Academy of General Dentistry, my mastership at the Academy of General Dentistry. I don't want to take all those courses, but it made me a better dentist because I saw things that I'd never seen. I took a six-month smile course. I took an Invisalign course. I did about a dozen cases of both. Kurt, you know what I learned about ortho? What? Ortho is hard. <laughs> and it's not predictable. And for me, not being very smart and being a needy puppy, that's where I loved CAD CAM dentistry. I was a CERAC user for 21 years. Their patient comes in with a problem. I hit them with my DigiDoc intro camera. There's a picture there before, during, after, bam. Build the unit, try it in, cement it, the after photo, you print it out, that's a business card, and you're done. So that that fulfilled my temperament. So that's 10 commandment number one. Awesome. Reason, most of your patient haven't said yes if you haven't even bothered to offer it to them. And if you do, you'll be amazed what happens. Totally agree. Amen, brother. What's commandment number two? 
commandment number two is the fact that people will buy what they value. They will buy what they want, not necessarily what they need. Okay, now we've heard that forever. We've heard that forever, but give us some context and some right. things that would make us see or hear that differently. People buy what they value, they buy what they want, not necessarily what they need. I had an Acura. My first adult car was an Acura Legend. I loved that car. And my wife sold it to my brother-in-law without my permission. And I'm like, Ababa, what just happened? He'd been overseas working in Europe for four months, four years, came back, needed a car. My wife sold him my car. I'm like, I love that car. So I had jeans and a t-shirt on. I went to the local Acura dealership with a check in my back pocket because I got money. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they did was pop open the hood and start explaining the cubic centimeter and the engine and the woofer and tweeter and stuff. I know nothing about it. And I'm embarrassed. And they so humiliated me. I left. I went by the Cadillac dealership and they were worse. And I left there. Finally, I go to the Toyota dealership. I felt like Julia Robertson, pretty woman. I have money. Nobody will take my money. <laughs> the clerk came out. Now this is back in the nineties. I said, sir, how can I help you? I said, I need a car. No one will sell me a car. He said, how can I help you? I said, I have three young kids. I want three shoulder straps in the back. And at the time, your CD players were always put in the trunk of your car. I said, I'd like to have a CD player in the car that I don't have to go into the trunk to put on music. He said, sir, here's an Avalon. It's got three shoulder straps in the back. It's got a six CD changer in the front of the car, in the dashboard. I said, I'll take it. He said, don't you want to test drive it? I said, you're not listening to me. I'll drive it if you insist. This looks fine. I know nothing about cars. It got You put the key in and it works. I'm happy. So I actually spent $10,000 less than I intended to just because they were so rude to me. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what I value and where I come from. So to have not to have the audacity to ask, to give permission, to ask Kurt, how healthy do you want to get and how soon do you want to get there? Yeah. It's amazing what you can learn just by asking a question, right? It, it, it's uh, flabbergasting to me. And um, that's one reason I love teaching my students. They very humbly have said my class is one of the best or the best they had in their entire four years at UNC. And it's because we talk about real world private practice Monday morning stuff. And we go through cases, single tooth, two teeth, four teeth, half arch, full arch, full mouth rehab. And we work through verbal skills of how do you get to yes and how do you outlisten the competition. And it's just, it's been mesmerizing. I, part of it is sad to me when I realize how much time I wasted in practice because I hadn't learned this. But yeah, part of it is maybe I wasn't ready to hear it yet. Mm -hmm. I had to get busy doing a whole lot of single tooth dentistry. Then I started going to Panky January 1990. And I went every January for six Januarys till I finished the curriculum. Then I got to teach at Panky. I got to go to Spear Education and go through that curriculum, which was just amazing. Steve Radcliffe, Gary DeWood, Frank Spear, um, amazing Sam Purry with CAD CAM Dentistry, just the winners of dentistry again. They have such a joy to learn at Spear and Panky. Amen, brother. That's pretty cool. Critical learning early in your career. So what's commandment number three? Commandment number three are what I call the eight magic words that Dr. Kathy Jameson asked me back in the year 2000 and changed my life. And she said these eight magic words. She said, how do you create the sense of urgency. Monday morning, 8 a.m., how will our teams create the sense of urgency that we have something important to say and the patients should take action? So again, to me, we are such a visual society. It still kills me. I was just at the Sarah World, the Serona, the Dense Bly Sarah World meeting uh, in Orlando last weekend, an amazing group of men and women and it still bamboozles me. I'll meet people who will spend $100,000 on a CERAC machine, a hundred grand on a CBCT, a cone beam machine, and there's time for an intraoral camera, and they'll say, well, I'm going to get a $200 online knockoff version that gives a crappy picture. And I'm like, I said, doctor, help me understand. You have an iPhone 1 or 2 now. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I've got the I iPhone 10 X on steroid. Why? Well, because it's got a better camera. It's a better picture. So then why aren't you using that chair side? You're losing a fortune. Since the year 2000, I worked with DigiDoc. It's an American company out of California. It's family owned. We had eight operatories, court, Kirk. We had eight intro cameras. We took pictures, every patient, every procedure, before, during, and after. If I could tell one thing to your audience that transformed my career, 
It's a picture on every patient for every procedure before, during, after ball game. Absolutely. For the hygienist listening, I think it is immoral. The patient's got a big chunk of lower anterior tartar. For you to not to have a before and after picture of what you've done, you tell the patient they should come back in three months. Well, why? You must need a new car. Does the insurance pay for it? Let me think about it. Let's get a pre-denial from Aetna. Instead of you show them the before and after, and they go, ah, I got it. In our office, Kurt, I don't know what, what you tell the ACT clients about pre not what we call pre-denials, predetermination from the insurance. We didn't do it in our practice because we had a color photo. We put the picture in front of our patient. They'd say, my tooth is cracked. You need to fix it. And if they then say, well, can we get a pre-denial from Aetna? I said, help me understand. You just said your tooth is cracked. You want me to fix it. And I'm honored to do that. How would you feel if we waited six to eight weeks to get the pre-denial back and your tooth split the rest of the way? Then your $1,500 build up and crown now is a extraction bone graft implant, custom abutment implant crown. You just went from $1,500 to five dollars 6000 How'd that work out for you? Mm-hmm. So if that makes sense, again, the sense of urgency to act Again, you don't know what my key buying issue is, but you ought to ask, is it important that you keep your teeth the rest of your life? Do you want anything about your smile you'd like to change? What are your goals for your health, your teeth, your smile? By asking those few fundamental questions, then you're giving people what they want and they're going to say yes 99.999% of the time. Our level of case acceptance, Kurt, humbly, was extraordinary. And I'm not that good and I'm not that smart but people taught me how to ask the right question. And I've got now, Kurt, why are you here? Why'd you leave your last dentist? What's the bottom line? How can I help you? Right. I want to keep my teeth the rest of my life fine. I can help you with that. Yeah. And then we take out the camera and we show them a healthy tooth. Then we'd show them a change going on and say, how can I help you? People said to me, Dr. Mark, well, a DigiDoc's expensive, isn't it? Over a year's time, if you work 200 days a year, it's going to cost you $21 a day. To slam guarantee, you're going to add $1,000 a day. You say, okay, Dr. Mark, I want to buy a cone beam and a Serac, but I don't have the money. What should I do? They get a DigiDoc, use it every day on every patient. For six months, there's a hundred grand you just added, not even trying. Yeah, absolutely. Talking is the least effective form of communication in the world now. And I don't know how you could do it without photos anymore because we all think in images. The other thing you said about urgency, urgency is just one of the principles of influence. Restaurants use it. Heck, if you order plane tickets online, Expedia uses it. There's two fares left at this price. And you're like, ah, it really gets people to take action. When I want something and somebody says there's only one table left, I'm all over it. But if they say, hey, look, we got plenty of tables, I'm not going to take any action. So It's got to be done authentically, but at the same token, I totally agree. You know, I would start with images and uh, learn learn what patients want. It makes a huge impact. It's I bought four different versions of the DigiDoc. I paid for them. It made me a bloody fortune. God forbid you get involved in litigation. That happened to me once in my career. Was humiliating. It was took five years to settle this case. The number one thing that saved me is I had before during and after photos mm-hmm. and Brilliant. a patient who said I want veneers and had circumferential decay class five wrapped around the tooth. And I said, you can't have veneers, but I want them, but I can't leave half the cavity. Right. And finally, she agreed to treatment and I did the crowns and then she got mad at me and went somewhere else and asked someone, how are my veneers? And they said, they're not veneers. And she sued me. Mm. It was humiliating Kurt, but because I had my photos that saved me. So yeah. young docs, before you get the confidence and the experience after you spend time at Panky or at Spear and you get your FAGD, MAGD with the Academy of General Dentistry, the camera, the photos will bail you out till you build a better repertoire, a better rap with your patients. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. What's commandment number four? Number four is the three magic words from Dale Carnegie, evidence defeats doubt. All right. People Describe that. Second opinion. Tell them why they don't need it. The evidence, the urgency to act, the evidence, it's huge. Why, why should I floss? Well, what's a, a beautiful thing? Uh, you know, my teeth don't hurt. I, my gums bleed, but th- like the normal amount. That always kills me when I heard that. I said, do your hands bleed? Well, no. So why should your mouth bleed? 
know, now that we can link gum disease, heart disease, diabetes, low birth weight babies, premature babies, Alzheimer's, all the itises, what I would say, folks, get your DigiDoc, take a picture of a t- tissue where it's inflamed, take a picture with a perio probe next to it, then sink the perio probe down to that seven millimeter pocket and take the picture and show the patient, you know, here's, here's a healthy papilla. It's pink, it's sharp, it's stippled like an orange peel. Here's your gum that's red and puffy. And here's our probe that measures how much infection is going down, going into your body all day long. Mm-hmm. So that's a wonderful thing. Again, I think the pride of what we do, a lot of our people that are unhappy in dentistry, Kurt, when they're not using photography, they do this gorgeous work. And all the patients say is, well, that was expensive. And you're like, but, but, but look at all my, look at the, my beautiful tertiary enamel anatomy. Look at how I recreated your enamel. And that, but patients don't know. Right. Chris Sager was executive director of Panky years ago. He said 97% of your patients have no clue what you're doing for them technically. It's all the experience. Mm-hmm. So the beauty of having the evidence of having the photography, that defeats the doubt. That's a great practice builder. That leads, when I left practice, Kurt, we had 1,200 five-star reviews because we asked, because we used the photography. We'd show the before, during, and after. We'd print it out. That was their business card when they walked out. And we would say, would you do me a favor? Would you take a couple seconds and go online? And if this knocked your socks off, if today did, would you honor me? What I used to say to him, Kurt, is would you lie? Talk about Tina, not the old fat man. And they go, oh, oh, oh you're not fat. Yeah. That was kind of cool. That made a huge impact on us. That's awesome. The new word of mouth is word of thumb. People say something good about you online, and a lot of times they're just speaking their mind. You got to ask for it. So I, I love that. Evidence defeats doubt. What's number five? Number five is everyone may not be a fascinating storyteller, but everyone does have a fascinating story. Love that one. I love with young docs when they'll start to present a case, they'll say, well, you know, here's a quadrant of MODs. I'm like, you just, you already blew it. Who are you? Tell me the story. Who's this patient? What's their temperament? Disc profile. What's their history? I mean, it's a given that we can figure out how to solve the quadrant of MOD, FL, TWA, KLM amalgams. That, that, that's a given. But what's the story? Chico was a patient of mine. I like to talk about him in my seminar. He had a scratchy white beard, white hair, always wore a flannel shirt with suspenders and torn blue jeans and tennis shoes. And he'd come into the office. And no matter what I said, why are you charged so much? Why did my last dentist tell me about this? Let me think about it. I mean, we worked on him and worked on him and gained his trust. I opened the Greensboro paper the next day. He donated $150 million to start a school. You got wow. no clue who you're working on. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, it's mind boggling to me. I mean, people have come in, they, they've been to another dentist. I think if you don't give them the courtesy of the time to tell their story, we, we have, there's an epidemic in dentistry, Kurt. I think you speak to this also. Am I right? Oral diarrhea. Yeah. You know, dentists spend too much time telling They tell because they think if they tell enough, it's everybody has a story and patients are dying to tell their story to somebody, but no one's really willing to listen. And when you get that, you really should be as an entire dental team, be listening 80% of the time and talking 20. That's usually a pretty good dynamic. 50-50 is still okay. It's not as ideal, but when you're talking 80 and they're talking 20, that's bad. It, it's the truest thing I've ever seen. I wonder if part of this comes from our dental education where you have three hours to do an occlusal amalgam on somebody. So you're there waiting for check steps. And so you just talk and talk and talk and just the power of getting stupid and saying, tell me more. How does it make you feel? What's your story? That, that is the beauty. If you recognize that everyone has an interesting story if you bother to listen and what you will find out, my exit question from my new patient experience is I would say to you, Kurt, can I ask you a question? I'd say have yes. You had a dentist start a visit like this? The answer would be no. 100% of the time, as I've never had a doctor sit down and talk to me like this. Mm-hmm. So how come a dumb redneck Jew like me can end up with a practice that got a 99% case acceptance when I'm not that smart and not that good? Because we give people that courtesy of listening to them and just asking good questions and leading them on, tell me more. How's it make you feel? What's your last dentist telling me? What are your goals for your health, your teeth, your smile? Who else is a decision maker here? You just keep asking and great things happen. 
Right. And I, I don't know the statistics behind this, but I heard somebody say this one time. People often never remember what you said, but they can always remember how they felt when they were with you. A tremendous, tremendous thing. What I, I will ask my first partner I had in the practice worked with me for eight and a half years. It was a woman. Dennis was a star. Uh, we just grew apart and chose to practice separately. But she was four foot 11 and wearing scrubs. It looked like somebody left their middle schooler at the office. And my wife's a nurse. She led an uprising at New York Hospital. She didn't want to wear those little white hats that the nurses used to wear, which I thought were kind of cute. But she said the nurses should be known by what they do and not by what they wear. For the women doctors listening to this, you absolutely should be known by what you do and your knowledge, not by what you wear. However, Dr. Kathy Jameson had my partner put on a nice blouse, dark slacks, nice shoes, and a white jacket monogrammed with her name. Her level of case acceptance skyrocketed. So I want you to think about that. Uh, well, look at my young doctors. They always introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dr. Smith. And I know you can't wait to call yourself doctor. But if you want to, you, it's on your monogrammed on your white jacket. You could. I would always go in and say, hey, I'm Mark. Welcome home. Mm-hmm. I'd go out in the reception room and shake their hand. And they was like, wow, you're the doctor. I'm like, yeah, welcome home. We're going to take good care of you. Bam. It's awesome. They, they said yes to me and I haven't even examined them. And you're setting yourself apart completely. You know what? In that- Nobody does that. Because you're so busy being busy instead of recognizing this is sacred time for that new patient experience. So that that's pretty cool. Amen. Hey, I'm just going to stop for a second and just tell anybody this is pure goal. So I would be taking notes if I were you, because I certainly am. What's uh, commandment number six? Number six is from brother Ken Blanchard, who said people don't want to take risks because they don't want to look bad. Okay, explain that one. Well, the big part of that to me is with case acceptance, you recognize, well, someone has a thousand dollars of dental insurance, Mm -hmm. which was what they had in 1970 adjusted to inflation. They got about 200 bucks of dental insurance, but they won't ask for a treatment plan that exceeds what the benefit will pay, which is crazy. And I don't want people to put down others dental insurance, but I want you to compliment. And I think we as a profession need to stop calling it insurance because it's not. It's a dental coupon. It's a copay. Mm-hmm. So why don't we just say, I'm thrilled you have a restricted dental benefit. You have your dental coupon that pays $1,000 a year. I'm thrilled you have it. It has nothing to do with optimal care. It has nothing to do with comprehensive care. It has nothing to do with your goals for your health, your teeth, and your smile. So help me understand, Kurt. Do you want me to limit what I offer you based on the arbitrary limits of your dental insurance? No way. Say yes, I'll say it. it's absolutely cool. My experience with physical therapist, I just wanted to scream. I'm like, I want my back to stop hurting. I have money. Well, the insurance may not pay. Where did Who told you that that was a factor for me? But our physician buds have just given that up. So when you don't want to look bad again, I think you're afraid to be honest in front of your patients. I think when you make a mistake, you... And what I would say to people, if you make a bad decision, chairside, if you do have a bad result, fix it right up front. Don't try to hide it. Yeah. Help the patient. God forbid, if you drilled the wrong tooth, stop, sit them up, show them and say, my intention was to do the back right molar number 31. I started on number 30. That had some breakdown in it. It wasn't what I was going to do. With your permission, I'm going to fix this at no charge. I'm going to fix the one behind it. Is that okay? Or you say, as a courtesy to you, there's no charge today at all. I'm going to secure both these tooth. Happy birthday. Is that okay? Yeah. Because it's front. Don't try to hide it. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's fair to say you're going to fail a lot in dentistry. In 30 some years, you're going to fail. The key is, is that you can't repeat failure. That's stupid. Every time you fail, make it fertilizer, a learning opportunity and say, hey, look. And it's also great to be just humble when that happens. I, I would love it if you'd. If you've cemented it and you didn't quite get a crown seated, look at him and say, when I set this on, I put it in backwards. I put the wrong one on. Whatever happened, with your permission, I'm just going to tickle it off. I'm going to have the lab reboot. It's going to take us one extra visit. Dinner's on me. Here's a gift certificate. Whatever it is, you just make it right and don't hope that they move away. Right. Don't hope that they die. <laughs> Well, the first thought I have as a patient is this is a good guy. This is a good guy. I mean, I want to know right up front if someone said this in the result I wanted, but I'm not going to stop 
till I get it right. right. People have asked me, Dr. Mark, did you guarantee your work? I said, I guarantee I'll be here for you. I guarantee my best effort. If I face plan, I'm going to fix it. And it's absolutely okay. Kurt, I'll confess here on national TV, I drilled the wrong tooth on a patient. I was a, a resident working at a prison on a rotation, and they brought in an 18-year-old murderer with hands and legs manacled, shackled. And I am so nervous. I think I wanted to do 19, and I did number 30. He still needed the work, but I'm like, oh, God, I could hardly see straight. That's the one time I didn't tell a patient I drilled the wrong tooth. I don't want to get out and come find me. <laughs> so, well, that's a special group of patients that I don't, I, I mean, that's a whole other conversation. They deserve my finest care, and he got They do. Just they wasn't, do. wasn't the one I wanted to work on. Absolutely, absolutely. So, what's commandment number seven? Commandment number seven is no one gets better at anything using yesterday's skills or last year's knowledge. Wait, 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 because, Mark, that's the way we've always done it, though. Absolutely. So- <laughs> I had a classmate of mine come up to me at a seminar. He got right in my face and said, Mark, I'm doing it just the way they taught me in dental school. I'm like, back off, sailor. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing anything the way they taught me in dental school. The principles of quality don't change. But man, the materials do. Mm-hmm. Why would you brag I'm doing it just the way they taught me in dental school? I started working in dentistry, Kurt. You know, you're going to say I'm old. I was 19. I've been in dentistry 41 years. I just had my 60th birthday in July. For the audience, yes, this is my hair in my color. My 40-year high school reunion, I got voted best hair. <laughs> Never had hair like yours. Probably uh, put gel in it too, don't you? I don't. I pick my grandparents well. But it, it's just craziness. So when I started in dentistry, started dental school in 1980, we took a Midwest handpiece with no fiber optic. You drill a big hole in the top of the tooth, two pounds of dical, a gallon of copolite, and you thumb in a tight and amalgam. I've said that at seminars and docs, and the audience go, son, I did that yesterday. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with it. Bonding was concise A and B. There was no acid etch. If you tried to acid etch and you got acid etch on the dentin, that meant go to endo. Mm. If you etched the dentin, that meant the tooth was going to need a root canal. Braces were train tracks, implants were malpractice, and it was so much better than dentistry used to be, and then you flash forward. So I was a CERAC 2 user, then 3D, then AC, then the Omnicam, and I went from X-ray film to digital radiography, where we had the CareStream sensors. I went from a Panorex to a cone beam, CBCT. I went from a rubber dam to 15 cotton rolls to an isolite. We had eight ops, we had eight isolites, we used it on every patient, every procedure. So kind of getting back to the success leaves clues, that was a success that we did. Pictures on every patient, the recurring theme. Local anesthetic, we did blocks in dental school on everybody. In private practice, I used a ligajet with a 30 extra short needle. We would buffer our local with the Onset, O-N-S-E-T, the On Pharma is the company. Have, have you interviewed Mick Falkel yet? No, I know Mick. He's a great I guy. Want, I want you to get Mick on the show using buffering of the local anesthetic. Basically, gang, we're injecting lemon juice. You think you're giving a gentle injection and it burns because the pH, the acidity of local anesthetic of lidocaine is 3.5. It's an acid, just like lemon juice. So you buffer and the pH of your lidocaine becomes 7.4, same as water. Statistics say it takes 67% after 15 minutes, your mandibular blocks are effective. If you buffer at the two minute mark, you're at 71%. At the eight minute mark, you're at 100. That one thing can save everybody listening an hour a day. It's awesome. People say, well, Dr. Mark, how much does it cost? Well, it's $2 a patient. Well, how do I charge that? I'm like, don't be a bigger dork than me. Mm -hmm. Give them the two bucks to get an extra hour a day. What do you charge per hour? Times 200 days a year, it's a $100,000 a year increase, not even trying. Amen, brother. Amen. Love it. Love it. What's commandment number eight? Number eight is continue education without action is just entertainment. Ooh. For the men and women listening, if you haven't seen Kurt Barrett live, I mean, you haven't seen Shakespeare the way it was made to be performed. You haven't seen... This man go nuts. He's an incredible inspiration. The combination of Kurt Barrett, Kerry Weber, 
Uchi Odiahu. These are the young stars of dentistry that just make me so proud to go to seminars and see them thundering away in front of a full house. And it just really touches me. But, and I, I try to use a lot of enthusiasm and passion and humor when I speak. And people say, Dr. Mark, that was great. Best thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, well, so what are you going to do Monday? Uh, I'm going to think about it. And in 30 days, I, I may get a camera. And in a year, I may, I'm like, no, you already lost. By the same token, Kurt, I know your audience is not taking notes at your seminar if I can keep up with you. And you got five pages of notes and say, okay, I'm going to do all five pages of these changes Monday morning, right? And the answer is, no, you're not. You'll die. Mm -hmm. I'll say, pick the one thing. Pick the single signature thing. Meet with your team. Bring in turkey sandwiches. Meet every day that next week at lunchtime and keep reading over the notes and keep prioritizing and see what's going to work. The yeah. Another thing I would say is you get the camera, you start taking the picture before, during, after. Totally agree. I think one of the best investments yeah. you can do is like some people go to Spear, they go to great courses. One of the best insurance policies to make sure that information sticks is to schedule a team meeting right after the course. So most of the information is going to go away in 72 hours. And team members already know this. When Dr. Mark Hyman comes home from a pra from a course and on Monday he's on fire, all the team members look at him and go, okay, nobody talk to him. Don't make eye contact. He will be back to normal on Wednesday. Now that big investment you just made on Friday and Thursday, that's wasted. So I think you got to have time. There are going to be courses that are great. Some of them not so great, but at least you got five pages of notes and you could pick a couple things and put them into action right away on Monday or Tuesday. So two quick thoughts. That's the reason you take your team to meetings as right. well. Absolutely. You come home with your hair on fire. Sorry, Kurt. You come home all fired up and the team goes, well, just leave him alone. He'll calm down. My team used to say that when I'd go to Panky, just give him a couple days. He'll, he'll calm back down. He'll be back down to earth. So I took my team to the Hinman in Atlanta, Georgia. It's one of the greatest dental meetings in the world. Kurt, Amen. you'll be in there next March and I'll be in the room right next to you. So I can't wait. P.S. I'm bringing about 50 of the UNC fourth year dental students down with me. I'm renting a bus and bringing over half of the senior class with me. I challenge other dental schools to match us. That is awesome. Hey, but what if I'm a dentist? I'm sure you heard. Hey, Mark, Mark, Mark. I don't want to bring my team to all these courses. You know, what if I fly them to him in? You know, I pay for all these people. I pay for their hotels. I pay like that's a lot of money. What if I pay all this money? And what if they leave? Well, then you gave them the gift of education that they'll take to their next office. And maybe the new employee that you got had a similar boss that was of abundance instead of scarcity. Right. So I took my team once to a Larry Rosenthal hands-on provisional course. Larry was the god of New York dentistry during his day and still is a sensational thought leader and clinician. And as my three dental assistants started to walk in, Larry was like, I'm sorry, this is a doctor-only course. And I said... Trust me, watch my guys. My three dental assistants went and they kicked the doctor's butt carving the provisionals. I was so proud of them. But that's the investment I would make in my team. Every woman on my team took a Dale Carnegie course. I mean, why would you study material titled How to Win Friends and Influence People? Right. How to Stop Worrying and Control Your Stress. So we'd bring in my Carnegie coach, Mr. Nigel Alston from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, every summer for a Carnegie update. So if all of my team went to Hinman. I took them all to the ADA in San Francisco. We took them to the Excellence in Dentistry meeting in Destin, Florida. We took them to the state meeting in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, the North Carolina meeting in South Carolina. I mean, we were constantly, we had a dream trip every year that we would go to. I took them to Vegas for the Discus Dental meeting back in the day when Discus had it going on before they got bought by Phillips. And we would have a, a CE day. We would meet two half-day Fridays where the team would come in and everything we made that day went into the kitty. So we would travel big time to these meetings. We'd get picked up by a limousine. We they wouldn't. I would put six people in one room. They'd have nice hotel rooms. We'd go out to five star restaurants, and we would do it up. Mm -hmm. And then what would they talk about to my patients the next month? Look what Dr. Mark did. He flew us to San Francisco to learn all this new stuff. Yep. So it just it 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 paid me back a hundredfold. The other piece of that, Kurt. As I think you say in your seminars, the statistics say if you lose one teammate a year, it's cost you a full year salary, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar loss per year times 10, 10 years. You're kidding me. Right. Yeah. Me. So to make that investment, that small investment, and then the team stays, my lead 
receptionist, Mary Catherine Ward. I worked for her for 25 years. Tina Calloway, my CDA, 19 years. Three of my hygienists were with me, 14, 15 years. That was one of the great gifts of my my practice career is their love and loyalty to me. Amen. And I, I was telling a young dentist this yesterday, people don't quit practices. They quit people. No one has ever quit a dental practice. They quit a person. They quit a dentist. So just be the dentist that nobody wants to quit on. Also too, Mark, when you make an investment, you're making a statement. You're like, I care about these people. And the single greatest asset, while you have 10 commandments, I don't have quite the list you do. I've got one, which is just find the best people and then get out of their way and give them the tools. Because at the end of the day, you'll go, that's the reason this place is successful is these people. So you got to invest. I I adored my team. I I miss them. I miss them terribly. When I turned 60, half of the former dream team took me out to dinner. So I'm not still paying them, but I paid it forward and I adore them and I miss them terribly. So that's good stuff. Amen, brother. What's commandment number nine? Number nine is you not merely want to be the best of the best. You want to be considered the only one who does what you do. That's from brother Jerry Garcia, rest in peace. For the young people in the house, that's not who made the Cherry Garcia ice cream by Ben and Jerry. That was the lead deadhead from the Grateful Dead. Okay, dive a little deeper on this one because I love this one. Yeah, you don't just want to be the best of the best. You want to be the only one who does what you do. The, again, the love and loyalty I had from my team was amazing. The love and loyalty I had from my patients was unbelievable. We had people that came in from England, from New York, from Florida, from California, from Nebraska. And I also had people in Greensboro that were two miles from my office and said, you're not convenient. So I didn't win them all, but I won a bunch of them. And to have that level of love and loyalty and trust and commitment where people would drive or fly to come see me, it, it was mind boggling to me. And also imperative that you give them enough time when somebody's traveled that far. I had one of those travelers come see me once and it was a busy day and I ran in and gave him a hug and a kiss and did my exam and said, so good to see you. I'll see you soon. And I started to walk back out and they looked at me and said, is that all I get? And I was like, oh, gloves off, sit back down, hold their hand, tell me what's going on. Let me see the pictures. Got way behind and earned it. So, you know, to become the only one who does what you do, part of it means that you let go of your limiting beliefs. You let go of what you know is how you were trained. And you turn to men and women like Kurt Barrett or Kerry Weber or Uchi Odiahu or Frank Spear or the, the giants of young giants of dentistry to say, teach me more, show me a new way. I'm already good. Let me get better. Right. And a big part of this also too, Mark, I would imagine is you got to be the best you don't try to be those people. I see a lot of people come back and try to emulate an instructor. You know, you got to be you in this whole process. Funny when I've done some speaker training for some young speakers and they'll tell some of my jokes and I'm like, you know, first, if you're not funny, don't try to be funny and don't try to be Kurt. Don't try to be Mark or Uchi, be yourself, find your unique proposition. Tell your story. There was a young doc on the speaking circuit that was about to speak at a major meeting at one of the little 20-minute quick like TED Talk things. And I was backstage with him, and he was apoplectic and on oxygen and about to die. And I just said, help me understand this. In this entire building, there's only one person that's qualified to give the talk you're about to give because that's you because no one can tell your story like you can. So just take a deep breath. Get out there. Tell your story. I promise you it's going to be unique. And he very humbly went out, knocked it out of the park, and was hugging and kissing and jumping all over me. And I was very touched by that because he's a rising star. And, you know, people took care of me and put a lot of their time and faith in me for my speaking. Taking the Dale Carnegie training, I took the How to Win Friends, Influence People, the eight-week Carnegie course. Then I did the two-day HIP high-impact presentation course where they videotape you doing eight three-minute talks. If anyone's looking to get into the speaking world or just be a better communicator, when I did my first seminar, I stunk. I stood behind the podium and held on for dear life and read my notes word for word like everyone else. And then I took the Carnegie training and got outside myself and became whatever I am now. Yeah. So, Kurt, I, I, I would love to see a video of you when you first started compared to now. I bet it's <laughs> 
<laughs> it's Friday. Well, I would say I did do the Dale Carnegie course. And then I actually do have a video of, of the first lecture I did, but everyone left at the break. And I was, I just kept talking. I thought if I would leave at the break, no one would notice, but it was Call empty at the end of the day. <laughs> it was a disaster, but you can't stay there. You got to start somewhere. Well, so, you can either quit or you can grow. And it's, I'm so absolutely. proud, so proud of you and what you've done. Well, I appreciate it, brother. And then, you know, as it comes to dentistry or anything, you know, or even presenting, you realize that the presentation isn't up here and it's not on a laptop. It's out there in the hearts of the people that you're serving. So that's a key term. Now, what's commandment number 10? Commandment number 10. This was on Facebook, so it must be true. When I did a webinar for Jameson and they quoted me saying, when I stopped telling people what they needed and started listening to what they wanted, everything changed. Love that. Now, you, I've heard you say this. I out-listened the competition. Yes. Go into that. You know, it, it's sort of a summation of everything we've talked about today, but the privilege of not telling anyone they need anything, need is a punitive four-letter word, the better one is what do you want? Mm -hmm. Brother Bill Blatchford has brought that to dentistry, the concept of no one needs anything. People have no teeth and can still eat. It's just a miserable quality of life. You can't sing and talk and kiss like you could if you had your teeth. So that's where, again, I ask people to kind of get stupid and listen and listen and listen and ask and just take your time and be focused on it. If you're in a rush during a consultation, you're not going to build that relationship that's going to get to 1,200 five-star reviews. If you're in a rush during the treatment presentation, you're not going to get a 99% case acceptance. But you give people, your patients, the privilege of your time. One of the first things I would say to our new patients is, you know, there are 200 some dentists in Greensboro and you picked me. Thank you. How many physicians have thanked you for coming to see them? Zero. I think the statistic is what? In eight seconds, 10 seconds, they're interrupting with a question. So I want our audiences to get stupid and just keep asking questions. Tell me more. Wow. That's interesting. Haven't heard that before. How do you mean? What'd your last dentist tell you? You just keep asking and peeling the onion till you get to the bottom line. Man, that's a fun way to practice. So again, I appreciated that quote that you've heard me say that, Kurt. I guess it must be true. But when I stopped being the doctor lording over the patients and telling them what they needed and just listened carefully for what they wanted for their health, for their teeth, for their smile, it became a whole lot of fun to give people what they wanted. Yeah, and you'll find it, once you get into it, it's so much easier than talking. Listening is way easier than talking if you enjoy it and understand it and can appreciate it. So, buddy, I love this. Now, we've got some bonus ones. So, we started with 10. You got a few bonus, you know. If you, you want if, more? If, yeah, if any of you have stayed this long, which I hope you haven't taken notes, Mark's got two extra that I love. So, give us the two. The All two right. Bonus. Number 11, bonus number one. If you are leading and no one's following you're just taking a walk. Mm, how important is that in a dental Eating practice? No one is following you. You're just taking a walk by yourself. That's one of the great joys in my seminar. I'll show my Abbey Road shot of my team crossing the street in unison. And all as I said to this group of women is, we're going to cross the street, left foot forward, ready, break. And I was the back of the line and the team took off and I trusted them. I trust them. I can't tell you, Kurt, how many of my Serac colleagues say to me, they do all of the imaging and designing where I trained all my teammates to do it. Now, why in the world would my certified dental assistants go to leave me into another office if all they were doing there is sitting there sucking spit, fighting a cotton roll, where my CDAs got to work with isolites and intral cameras, and they got to do this scanning, design, milling, try-in, pre-cementation radiograph, and they call in Dr. Wonderful to come back in. Mm -hmm. So that was my wonderful way to lead. Yeah. Well, and I've also, it was, it was Tina. I think it was Tina. You brought to a meeting that I was at yes, and sir. I said, so you work for him and she, and you stopped me and you go, no, 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 no. I work for her. It was a big, I, I mean, you were, you were really, I understood what you meant, but you were making a point right there. 19 years. It's like prison farming, but uh, what a joy, what an absolute joy. She, we, she reminded me, her interview, when she walked in, she came late, and I'm a stickler for time. And she walked in, I said, uh, thanks for being prompt. And she said, you're welcome. And I thought, this isn't going to last very long. So our 20-minute interview lasted four hours, and 19 years later, 
she was just a gift to my career. So what a hoot. So again, I want people to recognize that a whole lot of leadership is guiding, saying, you're bright, Kurt, I trust you. I got to go from A to Z. Get me there. Yeah. If your style is taking me A to B to C to D to E, fine. If you go A to Q to D to V to P to Z, I don't care. I trust you. You're bright. You've been trained. That, that, that's, it's, it's such a liberating thing. And again, it's one reason we have the level, I think, of love and loyalty and trust for my team is because I trained them well. One of the crimes we have in dentistry is we invest in qu equipment and we don't have training for it. Right. Absolutely. People often complain, well, I can't find great people out there. You don't understand. It's not that easy to lead. It, and I always say to a dentist, no, you, you understand, like finding great people requires that you become a great leader. And Kenny Chesney, I think he's got this song. It's build a better boat. Life is busy. It's crazy. Like build a boat that people want to be on, you know, well, that they enjoy the party that you're throwing on the boat. You know, what's interesting when I show a picture of my dream team, I'll point out every single woman in that picture used to work for another dentist. And then I got them. So this was the, one of the highest performing teams in the United States. And my colleagues all had them and blew it. For some reason, they let them go. They fired them. They didn't fulfill them. They embarrassed them, whatever it was. And all I can say to them is thank you, because I got the gift of working with these folks. Well, my first dental assistant I had, Susan Moshir, worked with me eight and a half years. She was number one in her dental assisting class. When I got to practice, all she was doing was suck and spit. And I was like, you ever made a provisional? Nope. Would you like to learn how? Yep. Bam, that took care of that. Awesome. Tremendous talent. So why wouldn't we give that gift, that compliment to our teammates and letting them use their ability to the nth degree and free us to be the CEO, to do doctor-only CEO stuff? It's fantastic. What's, uh, what's bonus number two? Bonus last number 12 and bonus number two is the expression, which I do love is as you hesitate to make one some of these decisions, I hope everybody will repeat this mantra. What is the worst thing that could happen if you ask? So one of the coolest things for me, 10 years ago, I turned 50. In my seminars, I'll talk about my baseball hero when I was a kid was Bob Gibson, was an all-star pitcher for St. Louis. And the first baseball game I saw was actually 50 years ago, perhaps today, watching with my grandfather, Sam, it's a little black and white TV, and I saw Bob Gibson pitch the first game of the 68 World Series. And he struck out 17 Detroit Tigers, all-time World Series record. And Pop and I are jumping up and down and going nuts watching Bob Gibson. That's the day I fell in love with baseball and became a Bob Gibson stalker. And then you flash forward when I was in, married early in private practice, my brother-in-law suggested we go buy baseball cards. And i kind of gotten away from baseball. I think the money's ruined it. We'll be going to a car store in New Jersey, and the clerk was, clerk was so rude to me. I said, do you have any Bob Gibson baseball cards? And he just blew me off, and I found one, and I ran him and said, sir, I found a Gibson card. How much is it? Book value. And he just ignored me, and I'm humiliated, standing there holding this stupid piece of cardboard. So I left. And this just aided me and aided me. Finally, I went into Collectibles Card Store in Greensboro, got right in the clerk's face, and said, do you have any Bob Gibson baseball cards? And he looked at me, and he said, Wow. Bob Gibson, all-star pitcher for St. Louis, 1-1-2 ERA in 1968, Cy Young Award winner, most valuable player. Sir, we have the five most valuable Gibson cards right here. Which one would you like to look at? And I said, all of them. The place went nuts. Women and children are diving for cover. Balloons are dropping. The band is playing. Bought 17 Bob Gibson baseball cards right there. Biggest sale he ever made in his life. And you think about the guy in New Jersey when the manager that day said, how was business? It, business stinks. Nobody's buying cards. And the manager in collectibles at the end of that day saying, I had the biggest sale of my life. What was the difference? He asked for it. The guy was, re he was responsive. He said, wow. He was prepared. He knew his stuff. And then he asked me, how many, which one would you like to look at? So when I turned 50, my wife took me to, to Chicago with my best friend and his wife to have dinner with Bob Gibson. That's awesome. So that was unbelievable. So she emailed the St. Louis Cardinals, got the name of Gibson's agent, wrote him, said, my husband talks about you in his seminar. He's not a thing person. He's turning 50. Could we meet you for a cup of coffee? Could we possibly have a dinner? 
and the, the agent called her and said, Bob doesn't do this. He did one of these celebrity dinners and didn't go well. But your story touched my heart. Yes. So we met in Chicago. He's driving over in the limo. Bob is with the with the agent. He says, is this kid a stalker? And when I first met Bob, I'm six feet tall. He's six feet tall. He's 10 pounds over his playing weight, 70 some years old at the time, handsome as all get out. And I shook his hand and held his shoulder and said, Bob, you have to understand you and I have been in a 40 year relationship. You just didn't know it. And we drank many bottles of wine and laughed and just had a blast. But the bottom line, Curtis, I would ask my audiences, what's the worst thing that can happen if you ask Bob Gibson to dinner? And he's going to say no. That's the he worst. He might say no. He might say yes. What is the worst thing that could happen from this moment on if you ask everybody you work on the rest of your career to accept the finest dentistry you have to offer? I think the worst okay, thing that could happen is that you didn't ask. That's the worst thing because you're missing half the – I mean, what did Wayne Gretzky say? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take? I love that quote. So that's what I – that's my last of the 12 commandments is what is the worst thing that could happen if you ask from today, from this moment on? For everybody except the very finest dentistry you got on the shelf. Yeah, I do that every day. Like, I love that. And I, can happen. Yeah, I try to teach my kids that. We go to, like, even a California pizza kitchen where we'll go, and I'll go, I want that table right there. And my kids are like, oh, my gosh, that section is all shut down. I go, no, 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 that one right in the corner. Because if I don't ask for it, they're going to put us right here in front of the door. while every, And off every single time, the lady will go, just give me a second. And she'll set it up, and we get our own little private table back in the corner. You don't get it. If you don't ask for it. Well, again, and so if you don't get it, you're still going to have pizza and it's going to be okay. It will be okay. Resent, you're going to resent in your gut because you knew that one sentence could have got you what you really wanted. Amen, brother. Now, we just got a question a little bit ago from our good friend Deepak, who's just a very thoughtful um <laughs> Viewer, he said, uh, do you have a process in place for taking a younger, new, high potential employee and helping them become outstanding like the hygienist you referenced at the beginning? So great question, Deepak. Appreciate that. Uh, the process was absolutely we worked. Our, we were working with Jameson Management, their consultant, their hygiene consultant, Drew Halverson, did one on one coaching. We had verbal skills. She took Dale Carnegie. We had our. Every morning we had our morning huddle. Every week I would have lunch, like the first Monday of a week, I'd have lunch, lunch with the assistants. Next Monday, the hygienist. Third Monday, the business team. The fourth Monday, two-hour team meeting. Twice a year, we'd have an off-site team meeting, all hands on deck. So we did a lot of training. We practiced. We practiced verbal skills. We'd practice at lunchtime. Um, you know, working with Patterson or Shine or Benco, whoever you work with. They're glad to help train folks on using Cavitrons, using the different technologies that we have for the hygienist. So I think, well, interesting piece, Kurt, and I haven't thought about this in a while. One of my teammates said, you know, remember when you hired me, you paid me to come in for a day and just watch. And I was like, well, I forgot that I did that. Because normally you have a hole in the hygiene schedule and you say, well, get a fill-in hygienist and just go clean some teeth. And I would say, no, you come in for a day and spend a day with us and listen to our verbal skills and watch how we do things and see our sterilization and how we get comfortable financials with care credit. We put a couple years ago, we put four hundred thousand dollars on care credit, just offer it to everybody instead of choose who we think needs it. But she reminded me that and I forgot about it. And I haven't talked about that in a while, mm -hmm. but we're so busy being busy. Look at the benefit to saying, okay, you've been here. I had a fill-in hygienist once who called me in with the patient and said, well, I fussed at him really good. I'm like, you fussed at my patient? You're so fired to get out of here. You don't yell at my people. It's not what we're about here. Right. To shame people into accepting treatment. You need to floss. You think that works? Mm -mm. So that, that's a neat thing. I hope that answered the question. Is the systems, you have to have a written staff manual. And we also would do a performance review, 30, 60, 90 days. Everybody's hired. We call it for an introductory period, not a probationary period, which I think is punitive. And we had a list that we'd go through where I would celebrate with a check, 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 check plus for things they were knocking out of the park. And where there were areas to grow, I would put a smiley face, not a minus. Right. And I didn't believe in no, we believed in not yet. 
And so it worked often. Yeah. The biggest problem for most team members is they're not given a clear line of sight and how they can succeed in a role. So Mark, Mark, I think you're absolutely correct. You got to create all that. Also too, I mean, you and I could sit down and come up with a list. I've got a, I got a ton of great treatment coordinators that were hygienists and I, I have doctors fly their hygienists to these offices. They come back after one day and they go, that place is amazing. And now they can see something that you couldn't show them, you know, and they can bring back those blessings to your office because that other office has worked hard at this. So you got to think outside of the box in this respect. There's so many great resources out there. So it's good stuff, buddy. I am so grateful to always have you on. I'm it's telling you guys, fun. oh, it's always fun. I, I've got a whole checklist of things now that I'm going to add to my repertoire and tell young dentists. And I hope you guys were taking notes too. This was absolute gold, like really high quality stuff. So Mark, I'm so grateful. We're going to have you back for so many other things. There are so many other things that I want to cover. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for watching the Best Practices Show. And if you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share it with your friends, share it with your colleagues, other people that are even considering being a dentist and say, follow these commandments. Keep sending us suggestions for shows of things that you want to see from Mark or anybody else. And I'll get Mark back and we'll ask him some tough questions. Uh, and uh, what's that? If anybody, my website is Dr. Yes. Mark Speaks www.drmarkspeaks.com. If anybody Absolutely. wants to call me, email me, check in, anything I can do for anybody, I would be honored. Give and me your cell phone number. You give me your cell phone number, don't you? Like, at 336 456 Text me, call me. My wife doesn't like that. I give it out, but too bad. People went to bat for me, so I have the privilege of sitting here on best practices. Anyway, I can help you, Kurt. You're, you're the man. No, you're the man. And I'm, we're going to put his uh, website in the uh, link here so you can click on the link. If you haven't had him speak to your study club, this is your guy. Get him out there. So until we see you guys next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.